Om Namo Bhagavate Vāsudevāya Om Namo Bhagavate Vāsudevāya Om Namo Bhagavate Vāsudevāya Pastor, <laughs> <laughs> 
So we're gonna read the chapter summary and then we'll go to the last portion of the chapter. So any anyone remember where we are in the in the book, I guess Bible came out of the God So what was the last what were the last few uh, past times she talked about it? All around the street. Yeah, a lot more. And then who shows up when he's with the gopis? We with the gorilla. Yeah, yeah. He was actually from Lord Ram's time. It's actually a very, very long time ago. And um, but he had a fall down because he was too proud of his strength. And then he had bad association. Manasur, Manasur was also proud of his thousand armies. So you have a too proud, proud people. They meet together like, yeah, we should draw. And um, so so he got proud. And then he, uh, he thought he could attack the Balram and you know, go the So he has to do with that. And then what else? There was one more past time, I guess. Fondrex oh, yeah. has another proud person. Uh, yeah, that was the funniest one. Fondrex has like the fake arms. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Two extra fake arms. I'm God. <laughs> yeah. I was yeah, I always wonder what they what he made out of like paper mache or plaster of Paris. So. But yeah, and as Con reckon, like there was I think there was something else after that. No, was that? Was that? Oh yeah, Kashi, 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 and his uh, King of Kashi and his son. Yeah, and then so finally now we are in the chapter called Marriage Son. All right, who like who like to read the chapter summary? Chapter 68, The Marriage of Samba. This chapter describes how the Kauravas captured Samba and how Lord Baladev dragged the city of Hastinapur to secure his release. Samba, the darling son of Jambavati, kidnapped Duryodhana's daughter Lakshmana from her Syayamvara assembly. In response, the Kauravas joined forces to arrest him. After Samba held them off single-handedly for some time, six warriors of the Kaurava party deprived him of his chariot, broke his bow to pieces and seized him, tied him up and brought him and Lakshmana back to Hastinapur. When King Udrasen heard of Samba's capture, he called upon the Yadavas to retaliate. Anger, they prepared to fight, but Lord Balaram pacified them, hoping to avoid a quarrel between the Kuru and Yadu dynasties. The Lord set off for Hastinapur, together with several Brahmanas and Yadava elders. A party of Yadavas set up camp in a garden outside the city, and Lord Balaram sent Uddhava to ascertain King Dhritarashtra's frame of mind. When Uddhava appeared in the Kaurava court and announced Lord Balaram's arrival, the Kauravas worshipped Uddhava and went to see the Lord, taking auspicious items to offer him. The Kauravas honored Balaram with rituals and items of respect, but when he conveyed Ugrasena's demand that they release Samba, they became angry. It is very amazing, he said, that the Yadavas are trying to give orders to the Kauravas. This is like a shoe trying to climb atop one's head. It is from us alone that the Yadavas have obtained their royal thrones, and yet now they are presuming themselves our equals. No longer will we extend to them royal privileges. Having said this, the Kaurava nobles went inside their city and Lord Baladev decided that the only way to deal with those who are maddened by false prestige is through brute punishment. Thus he took his plow weapon and intending to rid the earth of the Kurus, began dragging Hastinapur toward the Ganges. Seeing that their city was in imminent danger of falling into the river, 
The terrified Kauravas quickly brought Samba and Lakshmana before Lord Balaram and began to glorify him. Then they prayed, O oh Lord, please forgive us who are so ignorant of your true identity. Baladeva assured the Kauravas he would not harm them, and Duryodhana presented various wedding gifts to his daughter and new son-in-law. Then Duryodhana, extending his greeting to the Yadavas, requested Lord Baladeva to return to Dwaraka with Samba and Lakshman. Is that it? Yes. Yeah. the verse. Adya picha puram heta, Adya picha puram heta, Chaya Rama Vikrama, Samunatam Dakshinato, Nangaya Manudrishyate, Adya picha puram heta, Suchaya Rama Vikrama Samanatam Dakshinato Gangaya Manudrishyate Adya Picha Puramyeta Suchaya Rama Vikrama Samanatam Dakshinato Gangaya Manudrishyate Adya Picha Puramyeta Adya Picha Puramyeta so <laughs> Ganga <laughs> Again today, a be given turn and say, be indeed with that place, Sushayam, Shabbat Samibat, Rama of Dalbara, Vikram of the Pradesh, Samunatam from the Jit Ali, Dakshinata on the southern side, Gandaya, the Ganges, and the Dishikin. This translation, we can do it together. Even today, the city of Hastinapur is visibly illuminated on the southern side of the long Ganges, thus showing the signs of Lord Baran's Christ. Prabhupada Prabhupada is doing this. This is what Swami Dr. Prabhupada. So Prabhupada writes as well, actually, no, sorry, this is purposed by his disciples. They quote Prabhupada. Srila Prabhupada writes as follows. For the most part, it was the practice of the Chatriya kings to inaugurate some kind of fighting between the parties of the bride and bridegroom before the marriage. When Samba forcibly took away Lakshma, the elderly members of the Kuru dynasty were pleased to see that he was actually the suitable match for her. In order to see his personal strength, however, they fought with him, and without any respect for the regulations of fighting, they all arrested him. When the Yellow dynasty decided to release Samba from the confinement of the Kurus, Lord Baram came personally to settle the matter, and as a powerful chatriya, he ordered them to free Samba immediately. The Kauravas became superficially insulted by this order, so they challenged Lord Baram's power. They simply wanted to see him exhibit his inconceivable strength. Thus, with great pleasure, they handed over their daughter to Samba, and the whole matter was settled. The Yodhana, being affectionate towards his daughter Lakshmana, had her married to Samba in great pomp. Balaram was very satisfied after his great reception from the side of the Purus, and accompanied by the newly married couple, he started toward his capital city, Lord Balaram 
triumphantly in his Dwarka, where he met with many citizens who were all his devotees and friends. When they all assembled, Lord Balaram narrated the whole story of the marriage, and they were astonished to hear how Balaram had made the city of Hastinapur tremble. Thus end the purpose of humble servants of his divine grace to see the social problem. Um, yeah, so this this is how they got married back then. <laughs> so uh, these ceremonies would call Samwara ceremonies, where um, you know when the when the princess was ready of age and to be married, so the, the king would arrange for a Swamvara ceremony. And Swamvara means the chosen Vara. Vara means husband. So Swamvara. So the, the princess would actually choose the husband. So the various, you know, the news was spread normally and, you know, different kings would come and, and uh, all these chatriyas, these warriors would come and uh, to, to see if they can, yeah, if they can uh, win this princess. And uh, if, I don't know if how, how many Swamvara stories you've heard, but different kinds. Anyone, anyone remember any other famous Swamvara stories? Yeah, I'll be there. Um, Here's my okay. Oh, you can repeat if it's short. Yeah. Oh, just your slide. Do I drop with it somewhere? Yeah. And the shooting, yeah. Arrow into the eye. Yeah, yeah, shooting the arrow into the, in the eye of yeah. the fish. Yeah. Um, yeah, in the Mahabharata, and there's, there's this little section where Krishna tells you just have to aim the, he, he's telling Arjuna, you just have to aim for the uh, eyes of the fish. And he said, I'll keep the waters calm. And so it's, like, it's like in our life also, we just have to do our service, and Krishna's going to take care of everything else, which is the main thing, keeping the waters calm. Of the material world, but uh, yeah, that was um, actually they were in incognito at that time. The Pandavas, right? They were uh, they were they went there as brahmanas, and um, when they arrived, you know, brahmanas are normally like you know, skinny, and maybe they might have a little belly because they eat a lot of prasadam, but normally they're like skinny. You know, they just eat whatever um, donations they get from different people. But Chatris, on the other hand, are kings, or they're raised in families of kings, so they're well built, they're muscular, you know, their hands, you can see that, you know, when they use you know, weapons, and they, you can see that their hands have certain features because they have been trained in using all kinds of weapons. And so when these brahmanas arrived in the assembly, everybody looked at them, they were like, they don't look like brahmanas at all. <laughs> they look like well built, muscular, you know. Uh, it's like a professor walking in and the professor's really, really gigantic, like really muscular, like, okay, you know, that's different. But I said, it's kind of like that. These, you know, these prominent, these priests or, or professors walking look like these warriors instead. And so people could tell like, okay, they're not quite prominent. And, uh, but, you know, no one said anything. But uh, yeah, so all these all these warriors were there, or they were trying to win Draupadi. And that was another thing, somewhat rigged. It was, uh, at least sometimes, if not all the time. They were often rigged so that the princess could very easily choose the, the king you know, she wanted, uh, the, or the prince she wants to marry. And so in this case also, um, it was in a sense rigged that it was, the task was so hard, they knew only Arjuna could do it. And so, um, so yeah, they had this wheel thing. There's a fish that had, and then it will, you didn't just have to shoot the arrow in the eye of the fish, but you had to look at them at like a thing of water that would show the, you know, the fish on top of the ceiling. You look at that and you shoot the arrow up there. And so it was really hard and practically no one can do it. I think Karna was the only one who was able to shoot the fish, at least according to the TV show. <laughs> Um, so, <laughs> was able to shoot the fish, but not in the eye, and uh, but no one else could do it. And um, and so finally, yeah, Arjuna was able to do it. So that's how you know, uh, the the um, the Pandavas got um, Draupadi as their wife. And uh, yeah, when they when they brought her back, they they said, uh, "Oh, you know, told Queen Kunti that oh, we have 
we got something in donation today and she said yeah you know distribute it amongst yourselves and they're like ah oh. so that's why she has five husbands because Queen, Queen Kunti said that and there's a backstory to it Draupadi in her previous life or yeah I think it was previous life she had done a lot of austerities and she asked for a boon from Lord Shiva that she wants husband with these many qualities and it all those qualities couldn't be in one person so well she were granted the boon but then you know she ended up with five personalities who have all those qualities together um can I tell a side story to this actually <laughs> it's not related to about them but it's pretty clever there was this one um Muslim ruler I think it was Kilji Aladdin Kilji and he was he was really powerful and he was going down south conquering and um so he got to Vijayanagar kingdom in the south and um when he got there you know he uh the Vijayanagar kingdom they sent their one of the very smart ministers I think it was Tenali Rama and he went there and they wanted to broker peace so the the Aladdin Kilji said okay sure you know I'll 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 give you peace I, I, I will not wage war if you do this one thing, if you rewrite the Mahabharata as me as the central character, and they're everyone, you know, everyone went, oh my God, you know, <laughs> such sacrilege. <laughs> but Tanali Rama was very smart. And he said, sure, sure, I'll I'll have it ready. You know, just, you know, uh, just I'll have it ready in a few days, sure. So he comes back with this like huge, you know, huge manuscript, you know, big manuscript, and he starts to read, you know, and then he says, uh, there's there's Draupadi. And um, she had five husbands, and he and, he, and then he stopped and he said, "But I couldn't go further because I couldn't decide which one of the husbands you will be." And now, for for the loud and killed, normally you know, normally a king has many wives, not the other way around. Mm -hmm. And he was a very proud Muslim ruler, so for him that all the, all, all him and his his, <laughs> his Muslim posse, they were all like, really like, "Oh my God, you know." This is sacrilege. <laughs> so <laughs> that allowed him to be like, never mind, don't worry about it. <laughs> it would have been an insult for him to be one of the husbands <laughs> of one wife. <laughs> normally, it's the, yes, for the other, normally it's such as other way around. But anyway, so that's how then he just was like, all right, we'll, we're out of here. And he just left. He also knew that he actually couldn't defeat them in war. So he was just being, anyways, being a jerk. Um, but, um, but yeah, it was, it was very smart of Tanali Rama. But um, sorry, going back. <laughs> but um so yeah, that was Draupadi and then any other song words there was Lord in Ramayan also Lord Ram came yes sir yeah no go ahead yeah. I was thinking of the of the Mike, scene. Listen, Mike. I was thinking of the one scene. where uh Krishna from Dwaraka is winning queens and he had to amongst all the princes subdue a raging bull. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, the seven bulls. Yeah, yeah. I see. Yeah, who was that for? I can't remember the queen. I can't didn't. remember anything. It's one, one, of one of the principal ones. One of the principal queens. Yeah, yeah it was at the bottom, right? Satyabam. Was it Satyabam? No, no, Satyabam. Satyabam. Either Satyabam or Satyabam. 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 Yeah, so that was that. And then uh yeah, Ramayan Lord Ram also that was the bow. And um I believe it was from it was about Shiva's bow. Yeah. And then he was able to yeah, the challenge was to just to tie it. And nobody could well, no one could even lift it actually. <laughs> and then uh Lord Ram came not only to lift it, he tied it and tied it so tightly, he snapped the bow and uh, See, this father, King Janaka, had an associate who set up that test, full well knowing that the only person that could complete the test would be the Supreme Personality. So therefore, when it was completed, everyone was like, ah, oh, there he is. Yeah. yeah, I think that's all the Sanwar stories I know. And um, and so, yeah, at these Sanwar ceremonies, uh, that was the thing that, you know, that the princess could choose her prince to marry. And so in this one also, yeah, when uh, uh, Samba came and defeated all the kings, that was another common thing. The Somebody would come and would just defeat all the other warriors who were there. 
um, what's his name? He did that once. Bishma Dev. He came and he didn't even have to defeat. He just challenged them and nobody stood up <laughs> against them. <laughs> yeah, was that? No. That's okay. No, yeah, yeah, that's all right. Please go ahead. <laughs> and he actually went there so that he can have, uh, have the princesses for um, his two prince, um, which is Raviria and Chitrangada. And, um, and so, yeah, that's how he defeated them, the other warriors. But yeah, that was that was common those days, Sambara. And yeah, the nature of Chatriya is, is to fight this. And everybody has that nature. And um, it's like something you just can't not do. So with Chatriyas, they have to fight, even in, even if it's a marriage ceremony, even if it's a wedding, you know. Like we were reading about um how Rukmi's daughter was marrying a Krishna Abaram's one of one of Krishna, one of Krishna's sons. Yeah, one of Krishna's sons. And uh, yeah, in the marriage ceremony, you know, Baram ended up killing Rukmi, the father-in-law, and and um, broke the teeth of some other king of Kalinga. And um, and Prabhupada says in Krishna book, he said these affairs are very common in Chatriya weddings. And I was like, okay, <laughs> that's once matter of fact, it's very common, and or or very normal or something to that extent. And so Chatriya is oftentimes yeah, that's that's their main thing to show prowess and strength. And uh, so, especially when it comes to a, a ceremony like a wedding, then they, it's a time to show off their prowess. And it's it's, uh, it's almost expected that someone's going to die. <laughs> That's true. Or someone's going to get hurt. Yeah. 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 I don't know if this is true, but I heard that, you know how um, married women wear the red bindi or the red... You know, Sindhu, oh. that red color is supposed to mean that uh, that blood was shed over me. <laughs> to, That's pretty to, funny. To be married. Um, I, I've never heard that. It might be true, at least for the Shatya woman. But yeah. And, um, and yeah, Shatya woman also but intense, you know, they had a lot of fire as well. And um, quick, quick side story. There was this one Shatya queen and uh, the king went to war. And this was in Rajasthan, so Rajputs. So they went to war and he lost. He, and then, you know, he came back. So she was standing on the gate of the fort. It's a, a, a huge gate and on top she's standing over there. And uh, she, she orders the guards to keep the door closed. And the king sends a messenger around. The messenger like, the king's here. Can you open the door, please? And queen said, which king could it be? I heard we lost the war, so he must have died. Oh. A big, or, or, or if he's back, he, we must have won the war, but I heard we lost. So the king actually turned around, went back to fight. He won, came back, then they opened the doors. Yeah. <laughs> it was an imposter. It was an imposter. Yeah. If my husband would not, would not come back. back. Yeah. <laughs> After losing, yeah. It's like a famous story. <laughs> Can you imagine come back losing a war and the wife's like, get out of here? <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, that was that was that was Chatriyas. Uh, Chatriyas had a lot of uh, pride, a lot of honor and glory. You know, something that we don't see in any political leaders anymore. But um, but uh, even even like hundred years ago in World War One, you know, the I believe it was the Prime Minister of England. He actually fought in the trenches, and um, and so like that was the spirit that came. You go to war with the with the troops. Now you just order somebody to shoot the drone. As in the miles away, but um, but that was that was that was the spirit of Chatris, and that's why they were qualified to rule and and, and do a lot of administration and so forth. They had they had those um, yeah, they were just qualified for it. You know, they they had uh they had the right to do so. They're not just because not just because they were born in a certain family or somehow they got into the political office, but they actually were able to take care of people. They're actually able to provide. They're actually able to govern and so forth. And they lived their life based on certain higher principles. And so, yeah, when Samba was fighting, that was one of the religious codes that Korra was broke that they kind of ganged up on, on him. So that was one of the codes that I was often fought that you don't just say gang up on one warrior. And uh, anyone remember any other warrior in the Mahabharata who was ganged up on and killed? Yeah, okay. Abhimanyu. Yeah, Abhimanyu was uh, Parikshit's father. And so he was only like a teenager, basically 16, I believe. And uh, yeah, these. He was his warriors, like, you know, Bish, uh, was it? No, maybe not Bishma. Bishma, Bishma there too. Huh? And uh, Bishma, Kripacharya, 
who is the like the guru for the family and uh, and every yeah Karna every like is all his worry through um Dronacharya the Jayadatta oh, the was holding back on the other side of thing. But uh yeah, these warriors just ganged up on the 16-year-old and just killed him. I was very um, yeah, I was like a low point in the mob art. But, but um, but yeah, that was a code, uh code they followed normally when this gang. So they ganged up on Samba, and that's why Lord Baron was pointing it out. You know, you did this kind of not based on religious codes. So please, you know, return them and we'll have a nice wedding ceremony. But instead, like like any average materialistic group of people, they were like, oh, who are you to ask us of anything? You know? And um, that that often you know, happens um, in this world where when people just really get into um, that we own this, like, or this is, I have built this empire, or, you know, there's so much is mine and so much more will be mine. I can sound familiar either. Um, you know, I'll defeat this enemy and that enemy, and my family will be great. And you know, my it's like the demoniac mentality. That's very common, especially in the age of Kali. Because, yeah, because everybody just associates everything with themselves and they think, I have actually achieved all this. There's nothing beyond me. It's a very atheistic mentality. And even when you know we take up Krishna consciousness and we start chanting, you know, uh Hare Krishna, and we start chanting rounds and we start practicing uh Krishna consciousness. So when that when we do that, um, yeah, the heart starts getting cleansed. And these various underlying philosophies that we believe in, you know, overtly nobody goes around saying, you oh, know, I'm the boss, well, maybe some people do that. Mm-hmm. But uh, but you know, overtly nobody says that. But since we have been so conditioned in this material world for so long, on, on a very subconscious level, you know, that, that mentality is there. That actually, I own everything, and everybody should behave like I'm the center of everyone's lives, and everybody should just like worship me. And um, maybe it's not and not to that extent, but again, some people out there, uh, some political leaders, just like to see, yeah, like, yeah, worship me, you know, basically, and they just say it out loud. But if you have any any ounce of humility and you know, well, then you won't say it out loud at least. But uh, but yeah, because because we have been in the material for so long, and same thing with the carvers, they're like, oh, who are you to tell us what to do? You know, you are just you are our shoes. Now the shoes coming and sitting on top of the head, you know, and uh, because they were technically like the the main empire, the 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 Korvus, the Kuru dynasty. And uh, they were like, you just you just have this royal insignias, the the Kong shell, the yacht tail, the throne, and the royal bed. You just have those four things because we let you have it. And imagine saying that to Lord Bara, the first expansion of Krishna, the, the supreme most person around, you know, it's like uh, and um and then um yeah, Lord Bara just gets furious. All right. Yeah. Because he tried to like he tried nicely because Ugrasena was upset. Ugrasena was like, oh, we have to go attack these these Korvas because they have kidnapped our son. And um, that was another common, very common thing that used to happen back in the day. And you know, they come kidnap the daughter or the prince or the princess, and, and they're like, all right, wartime. And uh, so that was common. Ugrasena, like, we're gonna go to war. And Baron was like, well, let me go talk to them and do some diplomacy. Lord Balaram had a soft spot for Duryodhana, and Lakshmana was Duryodhana's daughter. So he had a little soft spot for him. He taught him, um, what's it called, the club, you know, fighting with the club. And, um, and yeah, because Krishna was, was kind to the Pandavas, so yeah, Krishna was like, okay, there has to be somebody to be kind to these, <laughs> these wretched Kauravas too. So Balaram was, you know, uh, was kind to them. And that's also Lord Baram's nature. And Lord Baram, when he came as Nanditananda, he was very kind to the, to, uh, to just well everybody really, <laughs> including um, Jagai and Madai. And uh, but yeah, going back to the past time, but yeah, uh, Lord Baram, yeah, Lord Baram is you know he's the supreme personality of Godhead, and he's just described in the Bhagavatam, he's white as milk, and when he walks, he walks like an elephant, stride of an elephant, and yeah, and then. When the in, when there's wars actually in the past, as you hear when Lord Baram is you know fighting and he look at the at the opponent and he would just he would growl 
<laughs> like a lion, you just growl at them. <laughs> so, <laughs> so yeah, Lord Baram is, is such, uh, yeah, he's, he's a supreme person. And um, and so yeah, these carvers they're saying, oh, you just, uh, what, what are what are you? What are the, what is the yeah, the dynasty without us? And so at that point, Lord Bara, yeah, first he, saw, he tried some of this diplomacy, you know, being nice. And then um, see, there's there's few things in diplomacy: sama, dana, and then danda. And so sama is yeah, being nice. You can be if, yeah, if you ever have a conflict, <laughs> you can be nice to the person. You can try some conflict resolution. You can you know ask open-ended questions and stuff like that. And um, if that doesn't work, then you could offer something, you know, some service, some money, <laughs> or <laughs> something. Yes, offer something. If that doesn't work, all right, it's time for Dunder, for the stick to come out. So then, and yeah, and then uh, there was a fourth one. It's it's from uh, Tanaka funded these four things. Then, and then if even punishment doesn't work, then you do pay the, that you do politics. You try to divide and conquer. And um, so Lord Baram, he doesn't need to do politics. He just, <laughs> he can just beat them up. And so yeah, he's, he, the, the, he went with the Danda and he started, he said, yeah, the, they're acting like animals, so they must be punished. There's no way to reason with them. And uh, so then Lord Baram just took out his plow and started dragging the whole city of Hastinapur into the Ganges. And so yeah, Lord Baram, you know, he's acting as a spiritual master. And yeah, he's the first expansion. And as the first expansion, he's the original guru. And um, yeah, I was thinking about how yeah, he's, he's teaching them a lesson. And because even when he spoke, he started speaking about Krishna, how he just started speaking about um, how all the demigods actually, they worship the, uh, the dust of Krishna's feet. And uh, because the Kauravas had said, oh, even Indra wouldn't dare come to us, to the Kauravas, to take anything from us, to ask for anything. And so Lord Bharam is saying, actually, actually um, all the demigods, they worship the feet on Krishna's feet. Uh, or the, they worship the dust on Krishna's feet. You see, the dust of Krishna's lotus feet, which is a source of holiness for all places of pilgrimage, is worshipped by all the great demigods. The principal deities of all planets are engaged in his service, and they consider themselves most fortunate to take the dust of the lotus feet of Krishna on their crowns. Great demigods like Lord Brahma and Lord Shiva, and even the goddess of fortune and I are simply parts of his spiritual identity. And we also carefully carry that dust on our heads. And still, Krishna is not fit to use a royal insignia or even sit on the royal throne. Say, so yeah, um, Lord Baram's being sarcastic at this point. It's a rhetorical question. But yeah, so Lord Baram, you know, the nature of spiritual master, the service of the spiritual master is to guide, guide the disciple in such a way so that the disciple makes... Um, progress towards going back to God. And as Prabhupada says, and he says like that, there's a phrase Prabhupada uses, but um, yeah, the progressive march on back to God. And so that is a service that spiritual master has. And um, yeah, these these services that are out there, you know, as spiritual master, and you know, when Lord Baram's acting as spiritual master, um, these are services, they're not, uh, they're not positions, or they're not, um, you know, it's not like, oh, now I'm the CEO or whatever. They're actually services. And so when when Krishna, and actually they said that when um, the Kauravas, they saw the, the Hastinapur being dragged, then they went back and begged to Lord Bharam and they praised him and said, oh, you are the, you know, you're an Anastasia where, you know, everything rests on you. Like now you, now you get it. <laughs> yeah, and, um, and they said that actually, that, um, that your anger is actually transcendental. You are not just being angry because you are in the modes of, uh, you know, clean modes. Claudia is saying that because, let's see, your anger is meant for instructing everyone. It is not a manifestation of hatred or envy, O Supreme Lord. You sustain the pure mode of goodness and you become angry only to maintain and protect this world. So, yeah, even with the spiritual master, when the spiritual master is, is um, not, not necessarily angry all the time, but when the spiritual master is guiding somebody in spiritual life, the, that spiritual master is doing that out of out of the mood of service, you know, out of out of the mood that you know the spirit soul. How to how how can I engage this person in Krishna's service? 
how can it how can this person actually realize their eternal relationship with Krishna? So that's the mood that one has. And we can all imbibe that mood in you know, whenever 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 and wherever we are as as representatives of Srila Prabhupada, as representatives of Krishna. And um we can we could do that actually. That who are we meet? Okay, how can I engage this person in Krishna's service? How could I what can I do to benefit this person spiritually? And uh it's it's a mood of service, it's not a mood of you know, lauding it over. Because you know, sometimes, and and sometimes it's funny because when people see a spiritual master, they think, oh, you know, they think he's he or, he or she is so proud, or why they're sitting on the vast on this throne, this asana, and so forth. And um, because they they think of those things because they're themselves very proud and envious, and that's why they're not qualified to be spiritual master. And uh, but when a devotee is actually uh, wanting to just help the average spirit soul out there in this material world to go back to God and then you know that that mood of compassion is there and that mood of service is there. And that should that was Srila Prabhupada's mood. I mean, Prabhupada, Prabhupada's mood was to serve his spiritual master. And he had deep compassion for everybody who was just so confused in this world. <laughs> That's the biggest problem actually that everybody is so confused. In the Bhagavad Gita also when Arjuna was you know, who is just so confused about what I should do in life. I mean, there's so many people out there who just are clueless. It's like, don't know what to do that will make them happy or what to do that will really satisfy them. Or, you know, a whole life is gone in just getting some education, getting a job, you know, raising a family, and then, you know, then you die. And uh, and sometimes people, like, yeah, my uncle just left his body about just a few weeks ago, and he was only sixty-eight. You know, he was probably you know not not long retired, and you know it's the time when you now you retire, your sons are grown up. He has two sons. Sons are grown up. They can take care of me, and you know now I, my my duties are kind of completed. I can just be peaceful, enjoy life. And in the West, like he he didn't really travel that much, but in the West, you know, people. At that time, then they go traveling, they do all kinds of things that they couldn't do when they were working. But then all of a sudden, like death just arrives, you know. And so it's life can be very easily um just wasted, wasted really. Confirmed. Uh life can be really easily wasted because so much, you know, there's so much to do, like you know, just having a job, is you know, paying a freaking 30-year-old. 30 year mortgage has yes, 30 years of your life you just tied to that you know <laughs> but um but so much of our life can just easily go and there's everybody out there with this 30 year mortgage it's just that's how you think when you see them um but yeah they, it's not just mortgage but there's so many things that can that hold down people and so the role of spiritual master is actually very glorious the spiritual master goes out of compassion and tries to basically wake people up like Hey, this is not the purpose of the human form of life. And trust me, it's so easy to just, just be an illusion. And even when one comes in touch with Krishna consciousness, actually, uh, even when people have spiritual realizations, there's people out there who have like out-of-body experiences. And uh, you know, they have those experiences, and then they kind of realize I'm not this body because they are literally looking down when they have those out-of-body experience, they're looking down at the body. So they clearly have a very deep realization that I'm not his body. But since they don't have any positive realization that how I can act as for a soul, they just can't do anything with that that half knowledge that they have. They just go back to whatever they're doing. It, it happens, you know, well, it happens often. People are having out-of-body experiences. But actually, we need that positive uh, knowledge. And that is that is the main service spiritual master provides. Like, how can one engage as a spiritual soul? How can one gain knowledge? And you know, what, what comes to mind? What else comes to mind when you think of a spiritual master or a spiritual teacher? What other qualities or qualifications or what does a spiritual master do? What else comes to mind? Yeah. 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 Um, guru also means heavy, oh, yeah. and usually people, I think we all think, oh, that means they are very intense, but it also means they're anchored and they're stable. So Guru is also, of course, serve as a source of inspiration, just because they're so absorbed in their Christian consciousness, then everyone else can be anchored by that 
can draw from that source of inspiration. What else? Yes, sir. A spiritual master has control of his senses. Mm -hmm. So um, his Vajra Vigam and Manasakrata Vigam. So he's, um, he can tolerate the urge to speak, the mind's demands, the actions of anger, and the urges of the tongue, belly, and genitals. And so he or she um, can really kind of choose all of, all of their actions. Mm -hmm. Like they don't, they aren't controlled by anything and they aren't um, compelled by anything. They really have, uh, they really can act with their own free will and they know that their free will, the, the correct way to use free will is in service to Krishna. Mm -hmm. So they're all, that's what they're always doing, no matter what. That reminds me of a quick story, just one uh, the what he was saying. The, uh, when Dhanavari marched, uh, whenever he would visit devotees, and whatever amount of prasadam he would get that day, he was happy. If he would get a little bit, he would be eaten. But, you know, if he would, when he would go to some devotees, he would get a huge plate of prasadam. And, you know, Dhanavari was like older and skinny, and, like, but he would just eat every day. <laughs> and his point was like, his, his tongue is actually controlled. He just he takes whatever Krishna provides that day, little or lot, and in, in order to respect and honor it, he just eat all of it. Or if there's just a little bit, you just eat that. But yeah, this made me think of that, that um, yeah, we, the, that a spiritual master or, or a devotee just acts uh, in accordance to Krishna, whatever Krishna's providing. And there's no like this huge disturbance, like, oh, you know, where is my next meal gonna come from? Um, because that's that's not why you become a spiritual master, so that you have many disciples to feed you. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, what else? Anything else? Yes, Professor Singapore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, as a uh, as a result of that, him being on a spontaneous platform and able to act freely and not under compulsion of the modes. He becomes uh, a, a transparent via media, and we can actually understand uh, that Krishna is coming to us through that person. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thanks. One of the things that came to mind is we live in a very individualistic society. Mm -hmm. People often play in our I don't need a spiritual master. Mm -hmm. I don't need anybody between me and God. Yeah. Yeah. And Rajiv Maharaj puts it really nicely. He said, just like spectacles in between your eyes and an object, yeah. but yet they help you to see properly. Even yeah. if it's between you and object. Yeah. Just to expand on what Russ Prabhu and Ashram were saying, um, the spiritual master helps you see Krishna, but he's also the actual link in the discipline succession because Krishna likes having a, a network of mm -hmm. like a community. That's yeah. Krishna's preferred way of just having his leelas is, you know, as he says, he likes it more when we serve his servants and trying to serve him directly. So the spiritual master is our opportunity to be part of Krishna's family in the way that Krishna wants us to be part of yeah, and um, going back to Lord Baram, yeah, this role of spiritual master is to really purify us, and to lead us in a way so that we can purify our lives. And uh, and yeah, sometimes it comes it comes in different forms, and, and uh, sometimes it does come as chastisement. And uh, Advaita Acharya was really happy when Lord Chaitanya finally chastised him. And uh, so a, a, a good disciple actually looks for looks for chastisement from special master of correction because that is the role that a special master is guiding uh, through is sometimes through just teachings or lessons but sometimes they yeah, actually chastisement and uh and in this case Lord Barra was really purifying them. So yeah the, the role of special master uh the special master uh sometimes for the sake of saving this disciple um, you know, advertently, inadvertently or, or intentionally kind of breaks their pride. That is that is one, one of the things special master does. Mm -hmm. Because as a one story, Shri Prabhupada had this disciple, uh, her name was Dilawati, we were just reading in the uh, Prabhupada Dilawati. So she, she went to Columbia University and she studied uh, classical studies. So the degree, you know, was the, uh, mythologies and theories. 
and uh, and uh, so she studied all that. So she thought she was very smart, and so and she Prabhupada, you know, she was smart, and Prabhupada actually she learned cooking very really fast. So Prabhupada started having her cook uh, his meals, and uh, but Prabhupada noticed, you know, Prabhupada noticed that she kind of thinks she's too smart. And uh, especially for the other hippies, you know, there are everyone else was just a hippie. <laughs> she was the one from Columbia University, and uh, so this one time she, it was a kadashi, and uh, so she thought it's fasting, and so I don't have to cook, or I'm gonna go there cook and make something quickly. So she goes to the kitchen, and Prabhupada's there himself cooking, and she's like, "Oh, Prabhupada, it's a fast day." And Prabhupada said, "It's a fast means feast day. And fasting for us means feast for Krishna, so you make a feast for Krishna." Mm -hmm. And uh, so. Prabhupada made this prep in front of her, and then you know it got offered, brought up to Prabhupada, and then uh, he had her taste it, and uh, he tasted. She tried it, and then he asked her, "What is it? You know, tell me. What, what what do you think it is?" And she was like, "Oh, sorry, I wasn't paying it. I was busy in the kitchen. I didn't. I don't know. I didn't see what because Prabhupada was making himself in the kitchen." And um, at that point, you know, Papa just started laughing and laughing. Oh, you do not know, or you can't tell, you know. And then he started laughing and laughing, and there were other disciples there, and they all started laughing <laughs> at the same point. And Lila is like almost like in tears, you know. And Papa could ask, you don't know, you, you, you know. And then he he called Govinda Dasi and he asked, told her to try. And she tried it, and she's and yeah, she said, Oh, Papa, it's simply wonderful. And um, and so and then she said um, she asked probably she asked her what is it? And she said it's uh, you know milk powder, sugar, butter. That was a simply wonderful sweets that we still make. And uh, and he said oh so she she was able to tell. And um, and so yeah, Lila Wati was humbled after that. You know she wasn't as proud anymore about her scholarship. <laughs> Um, but yeah, oftentimes the those special master is that the special master does make us humble, and uh, and um, and yeah, we we want to be careful that yeah we want to enter that relationship seriously because it is a, a relationship where one is a disciple, and um, and of course you know the special master is normally is very friendly it depends on the special master but uh, generally yeah it, it's it's like a friend also. But at the same time, uh, the special master is there to teach us. And um, and so we want to enter into that relationship with the special master with the mood that, yes, here I am, I'm going to learn something. And, uh, you know, it's it's like, it's the main thing that we are here to learn in this material world. So it's not a light thing. It's not it's not something, it's not just, you know, learning how to make like, whatever, cookies, whatever. You know, it's not something light. So it is... Um, it is something that will take a lot of effort and it is something that is serious. And so there will be times where there'll be ups and downs. And so, but the dedicated disciple never leaves the spiritual master. You know? And they have faith in the spiritual master and Krishna that yes, this is for my own purification. And um, and also the spiritual master and you know, the qualification of the spiritual master is that uh, Lord Chaitanya says that and when he was talking to Ramananda Rai, Ramananda Rai was not a, from a Brahmana caste. He was from a lower caste, but he was, you know, Lord Chaitanya was asking questions and he was answering. And so at that point, Lord Chaitanya said the words, uh, Kiva Vipraktabanyasi Shudra Kenetai. Go ahead. Say you're right. One who knows the science of Krishna is special master. You know, not, it doesn't, not a Shramana, Vipra, learned man, or Shudra, it doesn't matter what Varna, what, whatever caste one is from. One actually knows the science of Krishna. And that also goes to the point that it doesn't matter if one is a high, a highly intellectual person, or and then one actually need not be, you know, the spiritual master of Bhaktisiddhanta Gorka Shoda Bhavaji was an illiterate person. He actually couldn't read or write, but he knew the science of Krishna consciousness. And that is the main qualification uh, to be a spiritual master. Because sometimes, it, you know, there are all kinds of teachers out there. And they're like, well, we know Sanskrit, or we know, you know, we know, yes, somebody might know Sanskrit, or even even the religious scriptures, actually, for that matter. They might even know the Bhagavatam. They might know all these various texts in and out, and the Sanskrit, and they know the, the art of debating and, you know, bringing up these different texts from these different books. They might know all of it, but they might be totally bogus, because they don't, they're not following a spiritual master. 
and they do not quite understand the science of Krishna consciousness. As a matter of fact, they could be totally atheistic. <laughs> but um, one who is actually a sincere disciple then becomes a sincere spiritual master because they have that note that hey, I'm just simply serving my spiritual master. So yeah, one, one, one doesn't just become uh, a spiritual master on the qualifications of knowledge only. One actually has to have knowledge and vijnana and vijnana, knowledge and realization. And they have to act on that knowledge. And acting on that knowledge means that they're a humble servant of their spiritual master. And that's when they're a qualified spiritual master. And it's not, it's actually not a very, it's not a cheap thing. It's actually more expensive uh, and expensive. It's more expensive. <laughs> what was the other word I can't hear? Was that valuable? Yeah, thanks. It's, it's more valuable than being a big PhD from you know some big university in South Africa, whatever else, uh, or being being a big religious scholar. That is all well and good. That is all great, but it's totally worthless if one is not a humble servant of their spiritual master. Then they're not qualified to be a spiritual master. They might be a great religious scholar. So that's fine. But they're not a qualified special master. And I'm going to stop here. But any last thoughts, Gopi and uh, Adishan? Um, so I was just thinking I had quite an interesting thought that I think is very important. Um, Lord Balara came to them and they were the Kuru dynasty uh, mm -hmm. on top of the hill, as you said. And Lord Balaram. So why did Lord Balaram not? And Krishna not choose to appear in that dynasty, so if everyone could know, you know, they're on top as well. Oh. So similarly, um, sometimes we very advanced spiritualists can keep themselves a little hidden, and we can look, we can miss them basically. <clears throat> and uh, I actually, since coming here to Gainesville and Alachua. I feel like I've been noticing a certain phenomenon where there's so many Prabhupada disciples and elevated and spiritualists that devotees become a little familiar. And um, I think there's a great loss there because, you know, this, as we discussed on the community group at one point recently, Guru is, is multifarious, comes in many forms. So we do choose our own Guru, but, you know, for example, we are. Um, it's recommended that we see the god brothers of, and god sisters of our gurus on a similar level and treat them similarly. But here in, in this part of Florida, sometimes there's a very lax attitude. And I think we miss out on an opportunity to learn from all these amazing advanced devotees. Yeah. So I just thought I'd make it up. <laughs> when you were talking about uh, how it's not, not enough to just know, but to live, live it. Yeah. Just a quick Prabhupada story one time. This gentleman comes to Prabhupada and he says, So I'm Jack and recite all Bhagavad Gita in 45 minutes. Prabhupada said, oh, Can you live by it for at least one minute? <laughs> <laughs> can, you, can you live by the Bhagavad Gita for at least one minute? <laughs> Stop here. Should we help out on yeah, <laughs> 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 